Um, so your research has concentrated on the political, social, and cultural history of the age of revolutions, uh, and on the connections between North America and globally the Atlantic world, obviously. Uh, you might know Ashley's work through the first book that she published on uh, Haiti. It was called Encountering Revolution in 2010 with the John Hopkins University Press, where he explored the impact of uh, uh, the revolution on the uh, early United States. And today, uh, you're going to talk about revolutionary things. Uh, you published a, a very interesting book last year with the Yale University Press. And I quote, on the circulation of objects associated with the American, French, and Asian revolutions, and how these things drew diverse actors into debates over freedom, equality, and solidarity in, and I quote again, uniquely visceral and provocative ways. So, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, je voudrais d'abord remercier Eric Schoenberg pour son invitation and pour l'opportunité qui m'a donné de présenter ma recherche. Euh, je tiens également à renouveler euh, tous mes remerciements à Aurélie <coughs> Collet, euh, qui a organisé tous les préparatifs euh, du voyage. Euh, mon intervention aujourd'hui euh, sera faite en anglais, <rire> d'avance. Euh, merci pour votre patience. <rire> okay, so my presentation today and the book from which it is derived is animated by the following questions. How did objects become politicized in the age of revolutions, and to what ends? I argue that in the late 18th century and early 19th centuries, material culture shaped in distinct ways how people understood vital keywords such as equality and freedom, and how they tried to promote and thwart the realization of these ideals on the ground. Actors with sundry backgrounds, so enslaved and free, women and men, poor and elite, they all found opportunities through objects to participate in seminal debates of the era. To locate these contributions, I reconsider the intersection of politics and material culture. <coughs> Typically, we assess the political potential of objects within the context of individual revolutions, in this case, uh, the American or the French or the Haitian Revolution, with an emphasis on how new motifs contributed to building national political cultures at each site. But as we all know, these movements transcended national borders, and so too did objects associated with them. So I track uh, the Atlantic trajectories of diverse categories of things. So, let's see. Full screen. Full screen. Yeah, go full screen. Uh, diaporama, uh, 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 it's always the slides. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I look at diverse categories of things in, in the book. So I look at uh, ceramics, metalware, and, and furniture, uh, military clothing and accessories, like medallions and cockades. Um, I look at maps and prints. And I look at life-sized wax figures. So I show that the political influence of these border alighting objects differed from that of texts, and identifying their singular impact requires an active view of material culture. And I'm going to take this off because it's early in the morning, and a, little, <laughs> a, little, a little rough to have that leering at you as I speak. But all right, so there is a tendency to see objects as straightforward badges of political positions as either for or against revolution. But objects do not simply uh, transmit fixed messages. Material culture theorists and practitioners stress that people affect things, and that things affect lives in fundamental and sometimes unforeseen ways. So to understand an object's political resonance, then, we need to pay closer attention to what is often called 
It's materiality. And I highlight uh, three components of, of that. First, the traits unique to a type of object. So life-size wax figures versus uh, printed portraits, for instance. That figured in its specific political capacity. So I explore how wax figures engage with questions over revolutionary violence, uh, whereas printed portraits influence debates about popular sovereignty. Second, not only did different objects speak to different issues, but each category had limits that were distinct to its form as well. These bounds were structural in terms of where and of what uh, things were made. So an object's political possibilities were determined in part if it could be and was produced in Cap Francais or Philadelphia or Paris, and whether it was comprised of cloth or paper or ceramic. So the limits of revolutionary things were also socially constructed in that people had thresholds for tolerating alterations to aspects of their material worlds and to those of others. So some individuals were more willing and more able to change their dress accessories than their dinnerware. And lastly, context affected political influence. An object could promote or check change depending on, on who acquired and used it, how they used it, where, and to what ends. So a Queensware platter owned by an enslaved person in Virginia had political valences different from one found in the Duc d'Orléans household. Okay. So this tension across and within revolutionary things made them sites of contest, as people teased out political prospects and encountered obdurate restrictions in the world of goods. So I focus on this contest in the heat of, of the moment, from about 1770 to 1810, when participants and observers wrestled with events, with agents, and with ideas as they surfaced. So the quick succession of these three revolutions, and with France and Haiti, their simultaneity, that facilitates our inquiry into the effects of objects on the revolutionary present, instead of their role in nationalism or commemorations of the revolutionary past. Um, so in so doing, I look to recover the dynamism of Atlantic revolutionary things for the many individuals who interacted with them. So this morning, I want to explore some of the structural aspects of revolutionary object production that had a particular impact in North America and the Caribbean. Because of decades of mercantilism, uh, these societies had less capability than European nations to fabricate on a large scale items that were tied to their causes. The goods they did make, uh, for example, uh, in North America, homespun cloth, or in Saint-Domingue, voodoo drums, right? They did not circulate in great quantities in Atlantic markets. Okay? Um, so North American and Haitian revolutionaries relied heavily on European imports. Right? In some cases, this dependence undercut their political aims. But in other instances, European goods, including uh, British-made items, had radical potential. Uh, and it's this dynamic to which I'm, I'm going to explore a little bit this morning through one genre of objects. Okay. So by way of illustration, we're going to talk about military clothing. <laughs> On one level, the politicization of military clothing is obvious. From the choice of color to the various insignia, uniforms were designed to project the loyalty of the wearer, and to encourage a sense of common cause and belonging among fellow soldiers. But there is another equally powerful political component to uniforms that derives from their status as textiles. To uncover this other layer of meaning, we need to appraise three aspects of military clothing. We need to understand the value of textiles, the process through which uniforms were acquired by, by soldiers, 
And finally, we need to contemplate the sartorial reality of soldiers. And as we'll see, these facets resulted in opportunities for common soldiers to agitate uh, for their rights. <coughs> so first value. Uh, in contrast to the disposability of garments today, individuals in the early modern period had fewer articles of clothing because cloth, especially for items like coats, was expensive. Consequently, textiles were prized by people of all walks of life, and this fundamental understanding of value carried over into a military context. In fact, during the age of revolutions, military-issued garments were more commonly called clothing than uniforms, because what men wore on the battlefield uh, was not so far removed from the ordinary apparel of free men. By mid-century, the suit, a coat, breeches, and a, and a waistcoat, was the norm. And military uniforms uh, drew on this familiar form. So the parity between civilian and military garments enhanced their worth for a soldier, because unlike other army-issued items, he took his clothing with him at the conclusion of service. Um, and this clothing contributed to a man's economic wherewithal. And here you can see uh, a recruitment of soldiers, a kind of send up, but you see the two uh, officers dressed to the nines, um, and then these new recruits whose uh, sartorial reality is, is, is much below. Right? Um, as scholars have demonstrated, 18th century free men had a greater number and variety of garments compared to earlier generations. The average wardrobe of a Parisian artisan, for instance, consisted of between 15 and 20 principal articles. Whereas in the previous century, uh, a craftsman had two or three changes of daytime clothing. But even with this marked growth from, say, the 17th to the 18th century, the addition of an entire new suit every year represented a considerable increase for a poor or, or middling man. However, the economic impact of these garments was most substantial for black soldiers. Uh, for centuries, the master class enforced the status of enslaved people through dress. On Atlantic plantations, masters dispensed to black men a few items yearly, a couple of shirts or trousers, or enough fabric to sew them, usually of cheap, coarse material. The deliberate choice of inferior material and the absence of culturally significant items like coats and hats and shoes, that underscored the degraded station of the enslaved. Sometimes household slaves and coachmen acquired better articles and casts off from masters' families, and whenever possible, enslaved people supplemented their meager apparel uh, with items from market stores and traveling salesmen. In some colonies, like Saint-Domain, sumptuary laws buttressed racial and sartorial hierarchies. Free people of African descent and the enslaved were prohibited from wearing certain garments and specific materials, as white men and women feared the challenges clothing could pose to racist notions of white superiority. So for black men in the age of revolutions, military garments represented an economic and a social boom. When considering the value of clothing, it's worth noting that military clothing was not free. And this observation brings us to our second point, acquisition. At enlistment, a common soldier lacked the wherewithal to equip himself to he from head to so toe. Right? So he agreed to the garnishing of his wages to defray the cost of his attire. In other words, black and white soldiers bought their clothing from army suppliers and agents, which meant they had rights to it as owners. This distinction is important because in the civilian world, textiles were imbued with unique traits of possession. Some societies attached textile ownership to the person who wore it, including to married women and to the enslaved who lacked legal claims to other forms of property. And this ownership gave wearers, as well as purchasers, the ability to exercise specific rights over that clothing. They could sell it, they could trade it, they could gift it, they could alter it, right? 
Now, this consensus around textile rights did not change the legal status of the enslaved or married women. But in a military and revolutionary context, it had political prospects for black and white men, given the mechanisms through which garments were obtained. Okay. So all soldiers were quick to defend their right to military clothing because it was one of the few tangible aspects of their pay. During the Revolutionary Wars, each army set a daily wage rate for soldiers, but they rarely saw any of it in specie. Compensation was gobbled up by deductions for provisions, contributions to the hospital, commissions to the unit's agents, uh, and clothing, among other commitments. So administrators ascribed a monetary value to each garment so that governments and men knew the exact amounts subtracted from a soldier's wages. Uh, the Continental Congress annually set prices uh, for the Continental Army. So in 1778, uh, a coat was valued at $25, a vest at nine, a shirt at eight, breeches at 10. You get the idea. All right. Officials devised elaborate organizational charts. This is just like, this is me in the archives at the, at the TNA. Uh, and this is massive, it's about this big, but you get a sense of how they're keeping track. Um, so they, they put together these uh, elaborate organizational charts for tracking these deductions, but in practice, the systems were, were chaotic. In 1780, when a commission investigated the British Army's finances, it found the bureaucratic labyrinth around pay and deductions, including clothing, so impenetrable that the committee, as, as one historian described it, quote, they just abandoned their task with despair. <laughs> Forget it, which seems wonderful. All right, so clothing was the most concrete evidence of wages that a soldier witnessed. It was material and valuable, it belonged to him, and it lasted longer than a meal. Just as importantly, the chain of command recognized a soldier's clothing prerogative, one of, the, one of the few. Whether fighting for or against revolution, common soldiers relinquished many rights, submitting to military law and to the orders of their superiors. Soldiers resented and tested these constraints, yet they had little leverage, since with enlistments they cons consented to military authority. But the arrangement with clothing established an obligation since a soldier paid for his garments, the military had a, d a duty to deliver them in a timely manner. So when clothing did not arrive at a designated time, commanding officers took soldiers' grievances seriously. So in March 1777, uh, Captain Robert Kirkwood of the Continental Army read to his men a letter from headquarters in which, and I'm going to quote, the general is very sorry that there should be so much foundation for the frequent complaints of the soldiery respecting their pay and clothing. He is very sensible of these difficulties and promises them everything in his power to have them speedily redressed. Now, perhaps some, the men found some humor in the unintentional pun about speedy redressing, right? Um, but the letter's phrasing is revealing for its recognition of the justness of the soldier's complaints and, ex and an expressed commitment to do something uh, about them. Now, the Caribbean theater shows the degree to which the acceptance of a soldier's right to clothing pulverated the army. After the American Revolution, the Carolina Corps of Loyalist and mostly black troops was reassigned to, to Granada and served throughout the Leeward Islands. Governor Edward Matthew insisted that the men be paid and clothed as they had been uh, during the U.S. War of Independence. This directive sparked debate among some white planters because of the perceived threat to racial hierarchies. Nevertheless, Matthew enforced the standard, albeit with mixed results. In 1788, he protested to superiors that for three years had men had, not, had paid for, yet not received their clothing. The Treasury agreed to supply the garments, however, two years later, agents for the unit pressed officials for the outstanding balance. On the one hand, the case of the Carolina Corps points to how the right to clothing pervaded the military to such an extent that it applied to black soldiers. 
On the other hand, it illustrates the frustrations and limited recourse of officers and men when shipments of clothing did not appear. And this was a constant problem for all armies during the Age of Revolutions. Toussaint Louverture sent numerous missives to higher-ups pleading for clothing for his soldiers. In one example he writes, it is very painful for a commander who has seen his horses endure thirst and hunger and be exposed to the greatest danger to expel the British from the territory of Saint-Domingue. It is painful, I repeat, <coughs> to behold those very soldiers deprived even of such basic clothing as would cover their nudity. Now, racism exacerbated the situation of black soldiers, yet deficient clothing stock affected all troops. North America and Caribbean revolutionaries constantly scrambled for cloth imports through purchase, donations, or seizure, and all of these modes of acquisition were inconsistent. British and French forces suffered from supply glitches too. The task of outfitting so many men pressed the capacity of European manufacturers who made literally tons of cloth for the military annually. What's more, transatlantic shipments were plagued by periodic shortages of vessels, timing mishaps, administrative infighting, uh, and the fog of war, right? All of which compounded problems of supply. Now, some officials tried to diffuse soldiers' exasperation over clothing through appeals to sacrifice, right? So, after Louverture wrote yet another letter about inadequate provisions, the colony's commissioner, Le Jeune Felicité Soldenex, he regaled the general with episodes from the American and French revolutions when poorly equipped and outnumbered soldiers emerged victorious. He urged Louverture to, quote, remind the Republicans uh, under your command of these heroic traits. According to Sultanax, deprivation was part and parcel of wars against despotism, but such explanations had their limits among soldiers. An intractable lack of clothing led to protest. So John Robert Shaw joined a U.S. soldiers' march in Philadelphia to express, quote, our grievances such as no pay, no clothing, without which we could serve no longer. That demonstration was successful, but others were not so lucky. On the march in the winter of 1776, General Lee lost about 20, um, 2,700 men out of 3,000. And they deserted, as he put it, for want of clothing. Repeating clothing shortfalls offered opportunities for common soldiers to assert their rights. But their sense of rights went beyond mere procurement, procurement to a keen sense of quality. When clothing shipments were delivered, soldiers were not content to accept just any garment. They knew that not all shirts, for instance, were alike, and these differences in condition mattered. The better the shirt, the longer it lasted, and the more a soldier felt that he got the value he deserved. When the American soldier Joseph Plum Martin traveled with his lieutenant to retrieve clothing for their unit, his superior officer told him, as he put it, to take care of my own interest. I accordingly picked from the best of each article what was allowed to each man and bundled them up by themselves. So it's like rifling through the clothing, getting the best articles of code. So men expected the garments to reflect the degree of quality for which they paid, right? And they objected to inferior goods, at times refusing to accept them on principle. The problems with acquisition lead us to our third and, and final point for consideration, which is namely the issue of what soldiers actually wore. Posing this question is easier than answering it, because although army has kept records about the articles soldiers were supposed to get, mm -hmm. they did not record what men did wear, nor do many garments from the rank and file survive. The most consistent source is advertisement for deserters. And so I built a, a searchable database from the largest available cache of about 215 cases from North America between 1776 uh, and 1783. And the glimpse of the sort sartorial reality of soldiers reveals new facets in leveraging the ideological power of military clothing. Okay. 
let's focus on Coates, which were the most prized mm -hmm. article in both economic and social terms because they were the most expensive and they were the most prominent garments for military and civilian men. Right? Literally, a man would be known by his coat. Yeah. Right, so, in a military context, they were essential to the coveted ideal of uniformity, even as they bore the weight of honorifics that signaled rank and, and other distinctions. Over half of the deserter advertisements use the term either regimental, soldier, regular, or uniform right, to denote a coat with military provenance. The rest were distinguished by, by known types, such as watch or frock fashion by cut. And here is um, the, the garment that survives on the right is a, is a long coat. And then you can see these men in the prints wearing short coats. So there would be long coats, short coats, uh, straight-bodied coats. Right? Uh, and they were also identified by notable features like quilting, a kind of puffiness of, of the fabric. Right? All of these are found in civilian dress too. Uh, the predominant color of coats, when noted, was blue, but by a slender majority. Um, many were brown. Uh, there was a smattering of green, of gray, and a good number of red coats among uh, American soldiers. About a quarter of the coats were turned up with contrasting colors at the collar or the lapel of the cuffs, and that was a sign of military uh, sartorial distinction. A slim majority of the coats were made of the preferred fabric, which was broadcloth, because when you cut it, you don't have to, to seam it. Um, but there were also coats of homespun, of blankets, of calico, of linen, of shag, like those 1970 carpets, right, um, among others. All right, so this brief overview, I could go on, but I'm going to spare you. It's the morning. All right, of <laughs> cut, of color, of detail, of fabric. It shows the diversity among soldiers' most notable garment, one that was intended to give them collectively a homogeneous look. Right? Now, some of this variety resulted from differences between regiments, okay? but it can be found within individual units as well. So of the four deserters from Captain Park's company, um, who they all fought together, each man wore a different coat. So one was light colored, faced with blue, one was a blue uniform face with red. One was short, light, and colored. Um, and one wore a British regimental dyed brown with white edging. Right? Moreover, soldiers paired semi-conformable coats with non-regulation garments. Brown regimental coat with a striped waistcoat <laughs> vest underneath it. Or a blue one with brown linen breeches. Right? Despite this irregularity, these men were lucky. Right? There were many deserters whose only article worth mentioning was an old blanket coat with Anzenberg trousers and a felt hat. Right. So within this variegated and distressed clothing landscape, encounters with men, especially <coughs> common soldiers, who realize the martial sartorial ideal or even key components of it resonated strongly with few men dressed in the regulation uniforms for which they paid, those who manage the feat broadcast political statements bolder than we have realized. Men in full uniform claimed the economic, social, and cultural values imbued in those textiles, which among civilians announced their entitlements as owners, and within the army demanded an equality of station a right to be treated like any other member of their rank. Right. The political import was most radical for men of African descent, given the material and ideological degradation that uh, accompanied slavery and racism, and how some revolutions uh, challenge both. We might expect sartorial brilliance among leading black officers from the French Revolution. Right. Okay, so Toussaint Louverture, Alfred Christophe, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, among others, were frequently portrayed in complete uh, military regalia. Depictions of common black soldiers in full uniform were even more powerful. During the American Revolution, Jean-Baptiste Etoine de Roger, uh, a sub-lieutenant of the Royal Dupont a Regiment from what is now Switzerland, uh, sketched four soldiers, a famous image, no? 
There was a black infantryman from the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, going from left to right, a musketeer of the 2nd Canadian Regiment, uh, an American rifleman, go Canada, uh, and a gunner <laughs> from the Continental Artillery. Right? So among the four men, the white rifleman deviates the most mm -hmm. from the martial model. The side view shows off not only his unorthodox hunting shirt, but also his pouch, axe, powder horn, and a very long rifle. Right. While the attire of the black soldier differs from that of the three white men, right, those differences stem from distinctions of his unit. Right? He, more than so than the rifleman, exemplifies military aspirations in his clothing and accoutrement. Right? Equal in sartorial stature and military bearing to the white musketeer and gunner with whom he is pictured. Verger's uh, observations did not circulate outside his journal, yet they, as well as those of others, shed light on the thousands of interactions between black and white men who sized up one another's clothing on the battlefield, in camp, and, and on the march. Uh, several images of black soldiers, like those in Marcus Rainford's 1805 and historical accounts of the Black Empire of Haiti, were published and distributed among audiences located far away from the theaters of war. In one plate, a black private, the lowest ranking soldier in the French Republican Army, is impeccably dressed, right? From his cockaded and feathered hat and smartly cut coat to his form-fitting breeches and shiny black boots, he radiates martial sophistication. <coughs> a few eccentricities are meant to signal his Caribbean roots, so the large hoop earring and the turban-like shape of a hat. But for anyone, civilian or soldier, seeing the print, it would be hard to deny the fine quality and worth of his garments and his cultural and economic ability to conform to martial sartorial ideals. When white men met uniformed black soldiers in the field or as images of them moved through the Atlantic world, their attire spoke volumes about the wherewithal that was threaded through each garment and of the rights of possession over that clothing. In an age of revolutions, this material statement had political overtones. Free men of African descent who served in the Jamaica militia during the American Revolution expressed this connection overtly. Protesting exclusion from hurricane relief funds, they reminded the colonial assembly of their military service. They wrote, as good citizens and as, arms in, as in arms as soldiers, they have always done and are still ready to do their utmost in defense of the British Constitution. As concrete evidence of their loyalty, they cited their hefty outlay to clothe themselves in regimentals. And for that contribution, they contended that they deserve equal treatment as, quote, citizens. So to claim equal status via European-made military clothing <coughs> after centuries of degradation, men of African descent advanced one of the most radical and tangible claims of the Age of Revolutions. They used military conventions to insist on an equality that few among the master class were ready to accept. Napoleon Bonaparte and his advisors in Saint-Domingue grasped the immense ideological power of black men in uniform <coughs> when they decided in 1801 to reinstitute slavery on the island. Bonaparte summed up the motivation for the project in sartorial terms. As he said, he could no longer, quote, tolerate a single epaulet on the shoulders of black men. Force, however, was the only way to remove them after all, like the coats on which they were sewn, the epaulets belonged to the black soldiers who wore them. So for all of its hierarchical pretensions, military clothing offered many black and white men throughout the Atlantic world a material means through which to argue for equality. I'm going to get it, no worries. <laughs> Identifying the fullness of this challenge uh, has required a reconsideration of these garments in their 18th century context. Among some scholars, there is a tendency to see the nuances of material culture, uh, say the various cuts of coat or types of cloth, as antiquarian concerns. But for actors at the time, 
They were timely and they were telling, informing their understandings of the economic, social, and political value of clothing. Today, we've, we've worked to recover this texture so that we can comprehend the depth of meaning of these items in a revolutionary age. Certainly, this material articulation of equality was not the lofty notion enshrined in the Declaration of Independence or in the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, although for people of African descent and women, these were avows uh, far short. Yet the equality of military clothing was, for many men, palpable and valuable. It was evident in their present and practical in ways that declarations were sometimes <coughs> not. And when for sundry and often legitimate reasons, regimes failed to live up to their contra contractual obligations with military clothing, soldiers, black and white, gave voice to their discontent in terms, including rights, that were accepted. The government <coughs> responded to these demands as best they could, in part to serve their own purposes of reinforcing the hierarchies that were central to armies' effectiveness. But in the process, soldiers had opportunities to see and to express themselves as worthy of equal treatment, a vision that had enormous political consequences as men of African descent used these European-made instruments of war to attack, literally and figuratively, slavery and racism. There is a methodological payoff, too. It encourages us to look beyond the iconography insignia, uh, decorating objects, to recover how various aspects of their materiality provided <coughs> opportunities for politicization in the age of revolutions. And even more broadly, I'd like to suggest that this material <coughs> view of politics is important to interpretations of the US, French, and Haitian revolutions, because things were and they still are, vital to human existence. Whether enslaved or free, poor or elite, male or female, late 18th century individuals lived in material worlds in which people acted on things and were affected by them too. And given this fundamental condition, we cannot comprehend the achievements and the limitations of this defining era without taking the consequences of things Seriously. Okay, thank you. Thank you, actually, for this fascinating presentation. It opens new vistas for many of us, I think, to reconsider things that we come across. <laughs> you know, so, and also for looking at the way those subalterns, those who were described as subalterns, and the way they express their, their rights and uh, discontent. So um, I have a question, but I'd like, first of all, to Je vous demandais d'abord en français, pardon, si vous avez des questions à poser in English, or I can translate. So I need to speak English, so go ahead. Actually, I have two remarks. Okay. Uh, first of all, what struck me, you were looking at professional soldiers in a regular army. Right. Um, um, for those, um, let's say 95% of the time, they were in garrison, in barracks, or in forts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and only a small period of time they were in the field actually doing exercises or uh, fighting. Mm -hmm. But what I encountered for the overseas possessions, especially when they were uh, professional soldiers, um, where they were in garrison, they shared a uniform mm -hmm. with two or three men for mm -hmm. watch du duty. Mm -hmm. So. That's maybe an indication of, let's say, the lack of, of uniforms locally. Um, and my second remark is, um, there are also civic militias overseas. Right. And f in, in the Dutch colonies, you have four different co companies, mm -hmm. with each with a, a, a specific place mm -hmm. in hierarchy. At the top, you had the, the white Christians. Second came the white Jews, and then there was a debate between the, the colored company of the, the, the people of, of uh, the colored free people mm -hmm. and the free bl black people. And they had a debate which between them were, let's say, third 
or forth. Mm -hmm. And what I don't know, but I'm, I'm intrigued with your presentation, if that hierarchy is represented in the, the, the uniforms they wear. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with that. But I think that um, the, the hierarchy you see in the civic militia is maybe even more pronounced than in the regular army. I think, um, so, two points, <laughs> and two, or two, I'll, I'll shed a little bit of light as I can on, on your remarks. So, one thing I didn't get to talk about today in terms of uh, military clothing, but if you want to read the book, it's in there, is that um, <laughs> When, when men are together in camp, right? Whether that's in an official garrison or a fort. In the case of North America, it's it's a little sloppier, and I would argue in in Saint Domingue, uh, there are fewer forts and garrisons too. Um, there's a whole market for clothing as men are swapping and exchanging uh, what they are issued, right? And there's a valuation of that. And what is what I found um, particularly interesting too is that men are sewing a lot. Soldiers are sewing. They have a remarkable, I know. Yeah, all right, so they have a, a lot of skills. And so they're making sometimes their own garments. They're mending their garments. They are also looking for civilians, sometimes women, but um, <coughs> tailors too, who are mending them. So they are very attentive, not only to acquiring, but to maintaining them, adapting them, and sometimes using their own skill set, which, I found fascinating because we don't usually think of men sewing textiles beyond professionals, right, of tailors or enslaved tailors. Um, but it seems to me that that to me was important for their understanding of textile quality, a sense of fit, and of value, right, that they wanted to get uh, what they could. In terms of militias, I guess I focused, I focused on uh, the Continental Army and uh, the armies as they unfolded in, in Saint-Domingue and then the French and uh, British professional armies because I had the biggest cash for actually identifying what they were supposed to get, what mm. the regulations were, and then really trying to figure out how that worked on the grounds. Right? I think within the, if I were to do it with militias, I would have to go super, super local. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. But I think, I think I think your question is a valid one, right? Then, and it, it raises a different kind of question in that with professional armies, these are standards that are set from above, prices that are set from above, and uh, soldiers are signing on to that as part of their wages, so getting these things as, as, and recognizing their value and being able to take them with them. Mm -hmm. With a militia, the, the way that clothing worked, um, wouldn't be, I think, quite so top down. Right? It would be a bit of a, of a mix in terms of what people could bring to the table, mm. right? And what the aspirations of a particular leader of a militia unit would like. And then the gap in between in, in, uh, in cases of supply and demand of, around cloth, right? Um, so I, th I agree, I think that's a, a fascinating thing to think about. And then what would be the specific political valences of it within that context would be fascinating to consider too. Mm -hmm. Thank May you. I give, give a short reaction? Yeah. Um, the first thing is what happened with the overseas garrisons, um, uh, especially in the Americas, uh, in, in the Spanish context, but also in the British context in North America, is that the, the, the troops, after a couple of years, they domesticated, <laughs> which means they settled. Mm -hmm. Um, they grew vegetables, they f started a family, and for instance in the Spanish context there was a rule to rotate the, the garrisons after four years, so to intercept that process of domestication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my second uh, um, uh, reaction is that in, in the overseas settlements, uh, in the Spanish ones, in the British ones, in the Dutch ones, in the French ones, the civic militias are more, much more important than in Europe. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the 17th and 18th century, the civic militias in Europe, they became less and less important. On the other hand, in the overseas settlements, because, well, uh, um, to, to, to quote uh, a colleague of mine, Femme Gastra, um, uh, troops 
evaporated. <laughs> European troops evaporated. When, let's say, there was a death rate of 25%. So that means that after four years, all European soldiers were, were gone. As a, and as a consequence, during the 18th century, as a consequence of, of, of more tension in, in society, the civic militias became more and more important. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the difference between the overseas settlements in the Atlantic and uh, back home in, uh, yeah. in Europe. But I think in this case, for North America and the Caribbean, they would be, for at least the Continental Army and for, for uh, the armies, the Black Armies in San Domingue, those would be locals, mm -hmm. right? That yeah, are, that yeah, are proliferating yeah, that yeah, army, yeah. right? So they're... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what happens to you on the fields, for instance, if we look at Lexington or Concord, the people who died on the field in the, in the skirmishes, do you keep the coat? Do you turn the coat? Because, you know, the turning... Yeah, 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 yeah. I was wondering what, what they do, you know, with the, oh, they, the dead bodies. Like, yeah, they they claim it, or, or yeah. do people sort of steal it and then turn the coat, obviously? So. Yeah, no, um, well, the, the case of... Uh, they would steal, so from dead soldiers, dead British soldiers, Continental yeah. Armies would steal the coats, and they would try to dye them brown, mm -hmm. Um, but they didn't always get to the dying before they needed to wear it. So you'd have you'd have continental soldiers in, in mm -hmm. red coats. Mm -hmm. But they were definitely at the end of battles, going through the, the battlefields. And one of the prized things they would take was clothing, mm -hmm. um, either to fill out their own articles or to sell them. There's yeah. a there's an intense market Submarket for in exactly yeah, for yeah, and yeah. so the secondhand markets of 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 things, mm. there's a chapter on that too, um, <laughs> is, is just as, is, is scholars estimate as, as being equal in volume and value as that of what we think of like the world of consumption. Mm. Right, so, um, so auctions, actually for dead soldiers, uh, officers, they would auction sometimes articles of their clothing and send the money to the widow, right? So um, that this is a kind of stability of value, um, which is, which is important. Mm -hmm. Another question? So, <coughs> thank you, Ashley, for your presentation. Sorry for my voice. <laughs> um, at the Museum of American Revolution in Philadelphia, there is a mug uh, made in Britain in support of Boston. It, uh, it was the time of 1774 mm -hmm. or 1775. So, and I was wondering uh, if you know uh, if in mm -hmm. England there was a law against uh, making items uh, in support of American Revolution, or if manufacturers all uh, throughout the war were able to uh, allow right. to make you know uh, things favorable to enemies. Yeah, right. it's, it's, yeah. Because so there's a business there anyway. Yeah, yeah. business. <laughs> yeah. And, and you see that most often with ceramics, right? Like, those are, like if you go to the Smithsonian, there's the no stand back teapot, and on the, on the back it's repealed, right? Okay, so <coughs> I have a lot to say about that, so, but I'll be quick. So I think, um, yes, they could. Um, and especially the, the English potteries would, mm. would do something like that. But if you, if you look at the market of creamware that's coming out during the 1770s, it's, those kinds of wares are an extraordinarily small percentage of the market. So what they're selling most often are the, are the plainer wares uh, of Queensware. Um, <coughs> like that, right? Um, that's a shard that's... Um, found actually in uh, an enslaved dwelling, archaeological dig at, at Monticello, right? Um, so yes, they could uh, for, for marketing, the British in particular for that, but, but it is very small. They're great in museums because they, they, they're evocative, yeah. uh, and, they, and they play to like T.H. Breen's whole argument about um, makers it's a marketplace of revolution, right? Like, you can, if you can sell it, um, uh, and it's come on, but it's unusual. Mm. It's actually not the typical ceramic, and I'm more interested in the typical typical ceramic in an age of revolution. Mm -hmm. If you think about French fails, uh, all the, the like, you could chart, and, and the 18th century scholar did, like, the turns of the French Revolution based on um, what's on fails, right? Like, the, uh, the three hearts, the three flaming hearts, and then we go. 
Um, but that doesn't circulate really outside of France. I think I was able to find, thanks to Jeremy Popkin, who's awesome, one, uh, one, there was talk about trying to prevent those ceramics going into Saint-Domingue mm. um, because of allusions to liberty, <laughs> equality, fraternity. Um, but that doesn't have a market, say, in the US or certainly not in England, and it doesn't seem to penetrate much in the Caribbean. So what I found really interesting in this project was thinking about what circulates most widely in the Atlantic, mm -hmm. what would people would have the most access to. They would have more access to Plains Queenware than they would to that mug, which would be a novelty and a little more expensive. Um, to try to get a sense of um, how those might become political vectors in ways that don't necessarily announce a particular political position. Yeah. Thank you so much, folks. <laughs> and for your question. <laughs>